you will die. Boys and girls, it's time for the 13th Nights of Halloween from the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hey everybody, welcome to the 13 Nights of Halloween. Oh yeah. I'm Rish Outfield. <laughs> <laughs> what, wait, and our special guest with us today is the Kool-Aid Man. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, or rather, oh, yeah. He, uh, it's been too long. I think the last time, right, I, time I saw the Kool-Aid Man was on that very first episode of Family Guy. Ah, uh, yes. That's when he comes in and says, oh, yeah, when everybody says, oh, no. He's like, yes, for, due to your crimes, I sentence you to death. And the guy goes, oh, no. And uh, Kool-Aid Man bursts through the wall and goes, oh, yeah, which I <laughs> I guess I'm too young to remember the commercials. Uh, you don't remember those commercials, really? I vaguely do, but I don't remember that somebody would say, oh, no, and then Kool-Aid Man would say, oh, yeah. yeah. I don't remember if that was how they went or not. I do remember that, yeah, Kool-Aid Man would always burst in and say, oh, yeah, and then they'd make Kool-Aid and everyone was happy and had a grand old time because Kool-Aid does that. Kool-Aid is really good. <laughs> yeah, the last I remember of the Kool-Aid guy is the uh, Simpsons episode when uh, it, it goes back in time and Marge and Homer uh, meet at the camps that they go to and then they kiss and uh, it goes into this imagine me and you and you and me and it's this really psychedelic uh, like dream sequence that Homer has and uh, in one of the parts he falls down out of the sky and he lands inside the Kool-Aid guy. <laughs> And he pulls out a straw and he drinks all the Kool-Aid out of the inside of the Kool-Aid guy. And then the Kool-Aid guy's eyes turn to X's and he falls over dead. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Anyways, I'm Big Anglovich. <laughs> and I'm Rish Outfield. Welcome, everybody, to another fabulous episode of 13 Nights of Halloween. Yes. And I believe it's my turn to drive this episode. Ooh. Which is terrifying if you've ever been in a car with me. Yeah, it's going to be white knuckle. Keep your hands and arms and feet within the ride at all times. I, You know, I was going to say something about the spiders thing, but apparently that's an urban legend. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It says in order to swallow a spider in your sleep, a number of unlikely coincidences would all have to occur in sequence. You'd have to be sleeping with your mouth wide open. If a spider crawled on your face and over your lips, you'd likely feel it. So a spider would have to approach you by descending from the ceiling above you on a silk thread. The spider would have to hit the target, your mouth dead center, to avoid tickling your lips. And if it landed on your tongue, a highly sensitive surface, you would feel it for sure. So the spider would have to land at the back of your throat without touching anything on the way in. And then you'd have to swallow. But the real bottom line is spiders aren't going to voluntarily approach the mouth of a large predator. That's how a spider sees us, after all, as big, warm-blooded, threatening creatures that might eat them. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so we'll skip that part then. Sorry. So, in recording these episodes, I thought it would be fun if each of us just brought something to the table, a topic, and then we talked about it, and then it's the next person's turn in the next episode, and, and you don't really know what's coming. And I was thinking, because you're so into music... That we would talk a little bit about scary music, okay? Okay. I mean, you've always been more savvy about musical scores, and uh, you actually listened to classical music more than once in your life, and without a gun being pointed at your head. So sometimes it's fun to hear you say, well, oh, I know, you know, Lalo Schifrin did the score to that, and <laughs> I'm giving you more credit than you deserve. But still, you will say things like that, and I'll be like, oh, well, I didn't realize that. What else has he done? And then it's like, oh, I don't know a lot that I can't remember. I have them all on iTunes at home, but I can't think of them right now. Yeah, no big deal. But I've found, and I, and I think a lot of moviegoers would agree with me, that music makes a big difference as to whether you're frightened or not by a movie. Um, sometimes a movie can be pretty inexpertly done, 
And if the score is right or, or, you know, the score is halfway right, it's still scary. Or you can still jump when the music blares or get creeped out when something spooky is played on the piano or the violins start to... I I don't know. I'm talking like I know anything about music. (laughs) But... um, Come on, you composed our all-musical episode. Yeah, but that ended up getting deleted by R.O.T. before it aired. Oh, that's right. So no one will ever believe that I did that. Everyone's a critic. (laughs) What... What are a couple of your favorite scary scores? Well, I think probably the best scary score probably that there is, uh, in my opinion at least. And no, this it's just fact. I'm just going to state this. The best scary score that there is is John Williams' score to Jaws, I would say. Yeah, my kids won't even listen to that. I, I have the soundtrack and I'll put it on sometimes. And they're like, no, no, turn that one off. I don't want to hear it. Ah. Really? Uh, so they're a little timid type. They're not much for scary movies. Although they somehow saw a lot of Jaws years ago when they were much younger than they are now. When they were over at a friend's house, they watched it. And they're just like, oh, yeah, I saw the part where the girl gets eaten by the shark. I hated it. It was really scary. But yeah, I would say that has got to be the number one scary score that there is aside from that i've always liked the halloween score that it just goes on and on and on and on and on i don't know it shouldn't be that scary but it is maybe it's the repeat repetitiveness of it yeah, i don't know what would you say is the reason that that is scary I don't know. It is minimalist. You know, it's just John Carpenter with a synthesizer. And some of it, like, you know, there, there's a part where he goes, dant, 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 with the keyboard. And I, yeah, there's just something so low tech about that, so almost primitive about it, that I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a brilliant score. And it, it works. Right. There, there were a bunch of imitators after Halloween's success, but you don't remember any of those. None of them worked like Halloween's did. It's generally what happens with imitators, though. I'm not really sure what to chalk that up to, except for that, you know, he's obviously very talented, and he he's done other scores. I mean, I'd, I'd say he probably scored all of his films, or all but one of his films, and uh, often they sound very similar to Halloween. So, you know, maybe the theme to They Live or the theme to Prince of Darkness or the theme to Ghost of of Mars or something doesn't work as well. But just that one seemed to fire on all cylinders for the Halloween thing. Yeah, it really did. And it's kind of synonymous with scary now. I mean, you can put that music on to anything. I think it was Paranormal or no, Par- Paranorman, that's what the name of the movie is. That, that new movie that's coming out, or by the time this comes out. Came and gone, yes. Came and went, yeah, didn't get watched. But yeah, in the trailer, they have that bit where the, his phone rings, and it's the uh, Halloween theme song. His phone rings, it's like, dee 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 and he's like, oh my god, oh. He answers his phone, and it says, like, come outside. So he looks outside and there's a kid down there with a Jason hockey mask on. And he takes it off and goes, hey, you want to play some hockey? But yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, you know, you can immediately elicit a scary mood by playing that song. It, 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 the other one that kind of comes to mind, I don't know if this counts as soundtrack, but I guess it must be, is the uh, thing that you would get in the Friday the 13th movies where you got the ch 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 ha ha thing going on as uh as the scary parts are happening you know i th- I think that is part of the score i think that was harry manfredini and he he liked the way that mrs Voorhees said kill her mommy and so he would go kick kick ma, ma, ma. i believe that's 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 how the lore of where that came from goes yeah I remember in Scream, they did that. Like somebody was, oh, they heard something. And so they were, I think they were like on the phone or something. And they're like looking around. And then the other person on the other side of the phone goes, ah, ah, ah." 
and got a laugh out of that, you know, which made it kind of funny. But that, I think that's another one of those. It's really, it's just creepy, that sound that just keeps playing. I don't know. Uh, what what scores do you think are the uh, scariest scores or what scores scare you? Do you like, like scary, scary movies? movies? Well, this is getting really predictable. I'm, st- I'm afraid I'm going to mention this in every single episode. But a lot of these scores that have like a chorus of children, <laughs> going, la, 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 you know, that kind of thing, okay. that's really upsetting to me. Or, you know, I mean, just children chanting in Latin or children just, ah, I don't know. It's really effective. I don't know if it was done before The Omen, but it was done very famously in The Omen. And, uh, you know, I think I remember you mentioning that after The Lord of the Rings, it's in every movie. (laughs) Yeah, there's choral parts. Uh, Although I I would say it was before that. It was, uh, I think it was The Phantom Menace that really made the choral thing take off. Oh, for uh, Duel of the Fates? Right, with the Duel of the Fates. That seems to be the first one that I can remember where, you know, having a chorus as part of your soundtrack you know, where it became a big thing in action movies and fantasy movies and superhero movies and anything along those lines, they all have, uh, you just don't not have a chorus in films anymore. You have the choral parts all the time. Before that, you never had them. I don't remember, you know, before John Williams put it in that one, I don't know if he ever put it in other stuff. I have a lot of John Williams scores. and Oh, I, I think in Empire of the Sun, there was there was a chorus, children's oh, yeah. chorus, right? Oh, a children's chorus, creepy. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't meant to be scary, I don't think. You know what uh, movie soundtrack really creeped me out now that you remind me of it? Mm. Was the soundtrack to Coraline. Oh, okay. Who did that? That one was Bruno something. I can't remember his name, but it's the only thing I've ever uh, heard of by this guy. So it's hard to remember a, a one hit wonder like that. Um, he probably has other, lots of other, you know, scores out there. I just don't know him, but I want to say Bruno Coulet or something like that, but that could be totally wrong. You know, it's weird. Uh, one of the most famous horror scores is, uh, that of the exorcist and it wasn't even meant to be scary. It was tubular bells by Mike Oldfield, just sort of, you know, doing new age experimental music on the synthesizer and it got adopted for exorcist and now you hear that and you i mean it is just chilling there's something so awful about the tubular bells song you know and and i don't know if it's just that it was tainted or ruined or inextricably linked to exorcist or if somebody heard that in like 1971 they would have been like holy cow that is scary stuff what is that yeah i don't know uh it was bruno coulet by the way good job sir but yeah, that, that, that is interesting, those kind of things. There's certain things that just kind of are associated with scariness. And I think your children's choir singing in a creepy, weird way. The, the one thing about the Coraline soundtrack that they did is they never, they, they sound like they're singing words, but they're actually not. It's just a bunch of nonsense syllables that the uh, composer had made up for them to sing. So a lot of times it sounds like, oh, no, oh, maybe I think they're, they're singing in Italian. Oh, no, no, that's, oh, it's. Ah, it's just sounds, huh? Yeah, it's just a bunch of weird syllables that they sing, but they sing it really creepy. It's like, you know, the whole time. Oh, see, that's awful, dude. Do you have that score? I do. Yeah, it's super creepy and awesome. You might have to put a little bit on here because, yeah, that's just, I, I'm not really remembering it. But yeah, that's ooh, that's that's now it, it, your children are are okay. Your son at least is a big sissy. <laughs> so what did he think of Coraline? Was that just way too scary? Uh, I think they all handled it all right. Although none of them want to see it again. Uh, but I did force them all to to see it. I did have to tie them down. But yeah, they they watched it, and for the most part, they thought it was all right. They weren't too scared by it. Uh, you know, they were scared to the proper level. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I guess it was scary enough that they're like, nah, I don't want to see that again. Interesting. Yeah, see, I don't I don't want to see it again either. But it was a super creepy movie, man. Boy, that's 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 funny. I, and and uh, another score, and it's not really of a horror movie, but 
it's really scary is in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, John Williams did this just amazing chant for the thuggies where it'd go, Mola Ram, Sudha Ram, Mola Ram, Mola, you know what I'm talking about? Uh huh. Yep. And then it gets to that really screamy part at the end and goes, Yee! Yeah. Anyhow, <laughs> I had that on a cassette and I was just playing it one time to go to sleep and I fell asleep. And I guess that came on, you know, 10 minutes after I had fallen asleep or something like that. And my roommate heard it and he started to freak the hell out. I mean, he he was <laughs> sure that I was listening to some devil worshiping black mass ceremony or something like that. And yeah, he was freaking out and he woke everybody up. Yeah, he I, I tried to calm him down and said, oh, you know, there's this Indiana Jones movie and it's it's you know, it's not. A, but the damage was done. You know, he he had been freaked out by it. And it is really scary. You know, just all these people chanting in another language. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, you know, it's meant to be awful and ghastly and, you know. Yeah. Probably the scariest moment in any of those films, right? Probably, yeah. It's the darkest of those three and a half movies. And so, yeah, I just, I always, I loved that as a kid because it was, you know, I, I, it was one of the first scores I ever got. I think I got Empire Strikes Back. And Temple of Doom the same year were the and those were my first two movie scores, and uh, I just yeah I, I guess I was used to the thuggy ceremony track, but he wasn't and yeah it was <laughs> uh, it took some talk and I, I I think nowadays I would just you know call him names and get beat up but in those days you know I tried to be a peacemaker and tell him I wouldn't listen to that tape again. I'm sorry, I won't worship the devil anymore. But uh, what's it gonna take? I don't know. Do you enjoy listening to those scary scores, or is that something where it's like, "Ooh, that track is scary. I'm gonna skip that." Um, I don't think I get scared by a track, or if I think, "Oh, that track is scary," and I'll turn it off or something like that. I I enjoy it just fine. I don't seek them out per se, though, and I think it's probably just because I'm not a big horror fan, uh, horror film fan, I should say. I'm not like you that's seen every horror film that ever was, and even some of the ones that are still just in people's brains, you've already seen them. But the ones, you know, basically what I do when I decide to get a soundtrack is I'll, you know, if I watch a movie and the tra the soundtrack is something that I remember something that stands out to me and that I enjoy, then I will say, okay, that's something that I want to check out. And here and there I've gotten soundtracks to movies that I don't remember what the soundtrack was like, but I thought, nah, it's a movie that I really like. I ought to check out the soundtrack. <clears throat> so uh, that's generally how I get one. So, you know, if I don't watch the movie, I tend not to get the soundtrack to it, no matter how good it might turn out to be. You know, it could be the greatest soundtrack ever, but I, you know, if I haven't seen the film or also if the film, you know, didn't do it for me, if I just watched it and I was like, oh, the film was terrible, then music might even have negative connotations to me. And so I don't want to listen to it. So, you know, I don't, I don't skip it. Sometimes there's terrible movies and I'll still listen to the soundtrack, like the soundtrack to uh, Dracula, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Who did that? It was by Wojciech Kilar. You just made that story up. There ain't no girl like that. Right. It's a really good soundtrack, and I enjoy listening to that one, even though I thought the movie was kind of a turd. So, you know, sometimes that happens. And uh, and it's even kind of a scary soundtrack, too, the whole time. It's it's even got one of those kind of devil-worshipping rites, ceremony-type so songs in it as well, where it's just chanting and screaming and etc hmm. but i never listened to it in in the middle of the night with a roommate that was easily scared so i didn't have that problem. one time i did have a shirt that had glow in the dark it was a scooby-doo shirt and it had all these eyes in the background and the eyes were all glow in the dark i walked into my room while my roommate was in his bed asleep and he'd had the door shut and so it was really dark in there but i'd been outside where there was light so I walked in the room, and all he could see was the eyes that were glowing on my shirt. <laughs> and he woke up, and he's like, "What the, what the crap is, what's going on?" So that's the closest I, I came to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
I know. I, I, I know who you're talking about, too. Yeah. Because there's only one man who would freak out at Scooby-Doo eyes. <laughs> um, the, the last score, uh, the, the, the only one that I think would be comparable to Jaws and Halloween as like the big three horror movie scores uh, is Bernard Herrmann's score to Psycho. Oh, and yes. People talk about that all the time. And it's so famous, the violins for the shower scene that, you know, people still do that. Read, read, read to <laughs> signify, you know, stabbing. And uh, I believe that that whole score is just strings. There's no percussion. There's no horns or anything like that. They just decided for fun to just do an entire score with strings. And yeah, it's just really, really good. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I don't know enough about music to know whether it is all just strings or that's an urban legend or if it's just that scene, the shower scene that's just strings or. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't have the soundtrack to listen to the entirety of it to be able to uh, tell you. I did have a music appreciation class once in college. You've talked about that, but it, did it talk about film score? I can't remember a particular instance to it, but I'm sure we did. Yeah, I don't know. It was really interesting, and it did learn me a bunch of things about uh, music that I would never have known otherwise. So that was good. Whenever uh, somebody talks about an interesting class that they took, I always think, oh, I'd like to teach a class like that. Because, you know, if you can't do. And, you know, so, so there's just so many fun courses or, you know, the topics of conversations or fun assignments that you could give out. And to do a music appreciation class and you have to decide, OK, what are good examples or what is something that a well-rounded listener should know? That to me is really interesting. And so so was it mostly classical that it talked about or did it do folk and country and Western and, you know, rap and, and all this stuff? It was pretty much only classical music that we uh, went through. We started all the way back in medieval days. And worked our way through uh, the various periods of classical music and, and so forth. And one of the assignments, you know, like you were talking about your assignments you can do, one of them was to uh, attend a performance of the symphony orchestra, which was, it was cool. And we got like cheap tickets because we were students. We were able to get like a $5 ticket to go and see the symphony. Of course, we had to sit at the, I think I was against the back wall of the uh, theater. Yeah, we didn't really do other stuff we did a little very little bit i mean once we get to the 20th century some of that stuff came in we talked about where classical music went and how it led into things like jazz and rock and roll and etc but you know it was supposed to cover the entire history of music and since you know music's been going on for you know hundreds of years thousands of years really but only hundreds of years do we have examples of music that we can use and yeah you know rock and roll has been around for 50 years so that kind of stuff wasn't uh, as covered as much okay and did it help you appreciate is that where your appreciation for classical music came from or did you like it before then i would say i liked it before then probably but it definitely really widened my uh, appreciation for classical music and made me realize hey maybe i ought to get to know some of these other things a little bit more you know before that i liked classical music but like you would play songs put on a, a piece and you'd be like okay now where do you guys know this from and people are like oh that's the one that's from the scrubbing bubbles commercials from the looney tunes <laughs> or yeah or it's from the looney tunes or it's from oh yeah that's the song where on i love lucy they were stomping on the grapes to when they and they played that song you know it's that kind of stuff that people uh, know classical music from and that's what i knew it from before as well you know like, oh that's the lone ranger or whatever <laughs> you know eventually uh, by way of that class i was able to be able to learn music that i wouldn't have known otherwise because i hadn't heard it in any film or commercial or whatever and uh, that's cool because there's a lot of really good stuff out there that you just don't know unless you try to know it and most people won't try to know it because they think classical music is boring. Did that class help you appreciate Sting's last two terrible albums? <laughs> no, I'm afraid nothing can help me appreciate those. Huh. Okay. Because I was thinking of signing up at the community college if... Oh, yeah. I might appreciate them a little bit more than you, though, because of that class. Maybe slightly. 
you know, I think we've gotten off topic somehow. It's a little bit, yeah. We're supposed to be talking about scary things. Classical music is scary to some people. Well, there's a Night on Bald Mountain. Oh, yeah, that one's good. Is there a name to that organ tune that's always played around Halloween that's... You know that on the organ? Yeah, that's uh, a toccata. I think it's called toccata and fugue in blah, 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 D minor, opus 43. I don't know what all that stuff is. But yeah, it's toccata and fugue by uh, Bach that uh, that one comes from. I believe I have that one on my uh, iTunes here. Good one. And that, see, all that's always like gothic, cathedral, phantom, ominous house on the hill music now. Right. But what was that intended for? Well, I mean, Bach was like a, you know, he wrote most of his stuff for church. So I assume it was one of those kind of things. It was somehow uh, praising God. I don't know. Huh. Okay. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I, there's probably 10 people listening right now going, oh, gosh, why is this guy still talking? He's so stupid. Bach did it because of this. But um, hey, hey, big, I'm sorry. I've got to interrupt you. There's not 10 people listening right now. Oh, you're right. I hadn't considered so, that. So don't worry. Yeah, I can say whatever the hell I want and nobody will think I'm dumb because nobody's listening. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I guess that one enter, ended with a whimper. Well, that's all right. I dare you to do better in the next episode, okay? Oh, you're supposed to dare me to do worse because that's much more likely. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Yes, that brings us to the end, and uh, thank you for listening, and I guess we will hear from you. Wait, we won't hear from them. They will hear from us tomorrow. That's right. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. Bye. That gets my goat, or whatever this is ultimately called, is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivative license. Very sad. I like the soundtrack to uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Who did that? It was a Eastern European guy. Oh, well, we don't want to touch that. It's just that it's not the kind of name that pops straight into my head.